Today we're going to continue our mathematical review. Uh, today we're talking about distributions. Why do we need to talk about probability distributions for this course? There are a couple of reasons. We'll need to talk about probabilities of events for classification. We'll talk about probabilities of parameters for more complicated models. And we'll need probabilities for hypothesis testing to know whether two things are different or not. Probabilities are also useful for expressing uncertainties, like when you're looking at political polls or predictions. How are these different from the functions we've already talked about? Well, they're not really all that different. Mathematically, the biggest difference is that a distribution needs to sum to 1. Why is that? In everyday language, a probability is a chance that something might happen. A probability function takes an input and says how likely that event is. Okay, uh, but there's a limited set of things that are possible, right? So all the events need to sum to one. Exactly. Technically, this is called the sample space, and if you sum over all of the events in the sample space, it should be one. Let's start talking about what probability distribution functions look like. There are two broad types of distributions, discrete and continuous distributions. Discrete probability seems obvious. Uh, it's when you have data divided into two different buckets, some set of things. Uh, this can be head or tails or coin flip, uh, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for the roll of a die, or someone's citizenship. Uh, so what about the continuous event space? One way of thinking about continuous versus discrete is that it doesn't make sense to take the average of discrete data. Continuous data, in contrast, lie in a number line, stock prices, temperatures, etc. Okay, so it's like data types in Python. Integers are discrete, but floats are continuous. Uh, but you can represent colors as numbers, and then you could average black and white to get gray. True, it can get complicated once you start thinking about the data. Another example is zip codes. They look like numbers, but they're really discrete. For many applications, we'll make a simplifying assumption that makes our lives easier. Sometimes it makes sense for color to be discrete, sometimes it makes sense for it to be continuous. Okay, how do you create a probability function for a discrete distribution? What about something simple like a die? Okay, that's pretty simple. It's basically a table. For every outcome of the die, you return 1 over 6. So would there be any problem with representing this as a Python function that just returns 1 over 6? That wouldn't work, as uh, the sum would be more than 1. Okay, so it would have to look like this, first checking whether a number is in the event space, and then return 0 if it isn't. Exactly. Are there any other rules that probabilities have to follow? Uh, probabilities can't be negative. Right. If they were, you could make it sum to 1 if you had negative probabilities canceling positive probabilities. Okay, let's move on to continuous distributions. Probably the most famous distribution is called the Gaussian distribution. People might have also heard it referred to as the normal distribution or a bell curve. You've almost certainly seen it. Uh, it's defined by this function. Is there just one function? No, it's usually defined by two parameters, a mean and a variance. When we talk about parameters in a Python function, it changes what the function does. Is that the same here? It's exactly the same. The mean moves the normal distribution left or right, and the variance says how wide the bell of the distribution is. And all of this is encoded in the function. Right, the mean is usually called mu, and the variance is usually called sigma. The bigger the variance is, the more spread out the bell is. For the moment, let's just say that the variance is 1. And when we do that, it disappears from the equation. All right, so let's think about what happens when we stick in some value of x and we want to get the probability out. We take the difference between the mean and the x, square it, and then negate it. Right, so what does that do? This means that the function is smaller more negative, the further you get away from the mean. But this doesn't make sense if probabilities can't be negative. Exactly, and, and that's why we have the x function. That turns it into a positive number. But the larger the input into the x is, the larger the output is. So the closer you are to the mean, the higher the probability. And the bit with the square root makes it so that it's less than 1. 
Exactly. That's called the normalizer. So that if you consider all of the outcomes, it normalizes to one. But if I just sample a couple of values, this quickly gets to be more than 1.0. I thought probabilities could not sum to more than one. Exactly. And that's where continuous distributions are more complicated. We can't just sum them up. We need to integrate them. Ah, so it's not that the sum of all the values of the function sum to one. It's that the total area of the curve sums to one. So you'd need to multiply the values that you picked out by some width associated with the value. In other words, have a bunch of rectangles and you add up the areas of all the rectangles. That needs to sum to one. So this is where calculus comes in. The rectangles will become infinitely thin and then this becomes an integral. That's right. Although we won't actually be doing integrals in this class, it's useful to understand how integrals relate to probabilities. So that's where the bit under the square root comes in. That makes sure everything normalizes to one. So if we want to compute probabilities from a normal distribution, do we have to type in this big ugly formula? No, nope. uh, you can import directly from a Python package. If you don't put in the mean and variance, it assumes uh, mean zero and variance one, also called unit variance. This documentation talks about a CDF and a PDF. What are those? The PDF is a probability density function, exactly what we talked about before. The cumulative density function is a probability of getting an event less than a particular value. In other words, the integral up to that point on the probability density function. So, for example, the probability of getting less than the mean is 0.5. Right, since the distribution is symmetric, it looks the same to the left and the right of the mean. You might have also heard of a standard deviation, the probability of being within one of the mean of a standard normal is a little over two thirds. How would you call this function to verify that? Okay, so this would be between negative one and one. The probability of it being less than one is pretty easy. We can call that directly. But then this includes the probability of it being less than negative one. So we need to subtract that. Now you get uh, 0.682. Uh, In the next video, we'll be talking about vectors and matrices. But despite what you might think, that's not disconnected from distribution. We'll be seeing distributions of vectors. And those distributions themselves are parameterized by matrices. But before we get there, though, we'll need to talk about the mathematical foundations of matrices and vectors. If you want to see more videos like this, check the video description for the course that comes from the link down below. You can then see the context and the correct order for watching these videos. YouTube will gleefully show you stuff in the wrong order. If you want other people to see this video, provide a big gradient to the recommendation algorithm by clicking the like and subscribe button down below.